In this lecture, we'll discuss uh, regression models with observational data. The observational studies have no randomized stream assignment. Uh, the units self-select themselves into the treatment group, so the researchers have no control over who receives the treatment and who belongs to the control group. As a result, we have confounding problems. So here, the confounding uh, implies that the treatment is not independent of potential outcomes. So we cannot simply just uh, compare the treatment group and control group and uh, compute the difference in means to estimate the average treatment phase. So confounding means that the treatment is no longer independent of the potential outcomes. The treatment assignment mechanism is often unknown. Uh, if it's known, like regression discontinuity design, we have a clever way of identifying causal effects, but oftentimes the treatment assignment mechanism is unknown. However, it is very important if you are analyzing observational data to figure out what type of factors really influence the decision to take up the treatment or decision to assign the treatment to certain units. And um, if you're uh, studying, say, medical treatment, effect of medical treatments, you have to figure out how, why certain doctors um, assign this particular treatment to certain, uh, certain patients uh, rather than others. So what how factors really influence their decision? So it's very important to figure out uh, what the treatment assignment mechanism is and what are the factors that are involved in that mechanism. Um, the another problem of the observational study is that there is a possible existence of unobserved confounders. So not just observed confounders, which we might be able to measure, but there might be unobserved confounders, which we have no measurement. So what this means is that credible causal inference in observational studies is difficult, and you have to figure out the identification assumption or identification strategy. So we need to make some assumptions in order to identify causal effects. In causal inference, identification of causal effects precedes statistical inference about the estimation of causal effects. What is identification? Uh, well, identification asks the question of how much can you learn about the estimate, the causal estimate, the, the quantity you're interested in estimating, if you had an infinite amount of data. So forget about small sample problems. Suppose you can have uh, as many observations as you like, um, can we still learn about the estimate, the causal estimate? Can we pinpoint the causal estimate uh, we are interested in? It's often possible, for example, if there is a selection bias due to unobserved confounders, even if you had a huge amount of data, that doesn't, uh, you still have bias uh, of the treatment effect estimation. So identification question really uh, asks, you know, what are the assumptions uh, are you making in order to pinpoint the causal effect estimates if you had a huge amount of data? The statistical inference, on the other hand, is concerned about how much can we learn about estimate from a finite sample. So even though if we had an infinite amount of data, we can pinpoint ex the answer exactly, since we only have uh, a finite amount of data, what are the standard errors uh, resulting from that small sample size? Okay, so this is two different, um, very two, two two different questions. And in causal inference, identification is important because if the quantity is not identified, it doesn't really matter how much uh, data you have. Um, you know that doesn't help you uh, overcome some of those selection bias issues. So we're going to pay particular attention in this course the issue of identification. Now, how do we identify the average streaming effect uh, in observational studies? We're gonna first introduce the standard, um, the assumptions that are often used by researchers. Okay. So first, uh, we often assume there's an overlap, or sometimes this assumption is called positivity, and the assumption really implies that there's no extrapolation. So the assumption says that for any um, observed xi uh, variable, covariate xi, free treatment covariate xi, the, the treatment uh, probability is bounded away from 0 and 1. So what this means is that 
everybody has non-zero probability of receiving achievement and non-zero probability of being assigned to the control group. Okay, so, so in other words, there's some stochasticness. There's some randomness in terms of who gets treatment, uh, who doesn't get treatment. So this assumption would be violated if, for example, certain people are not eligible for, say, social welfare program when you're trying to evaluate the eff efficacy of that program. Okay, so if somebody, say, there's an age cutoff, only older people are eligible for that program, you should not be including the younger people in your uh, data sample because those people have zero probability, zero chance of receiving the treatment. Okay, so the data the, the uh, data you are analyzing, everybody should have had some chance, even if it's small, some chance of receiving the treatment and being in the control group. And that stochastic assignment is the one that uh, we're gonna exploit in order, in order to uh, infer the average stream impact in the observational studies. Contrast this to the regression discontinuity design. So there, conditional on the x, the forcing by x, the treatment assignment was deterministic. So in that case, the overlap assumption was um, violated, right? So we had this threshold, above the threshold, for example, everybody received the treatment, uh, below the threshold, for example, uh, they, uh, nobody receives the treatment. In that case, we had some. Uh, we needed to do some extrapolation um, to estimate the average stream effect beyond just at the at the particular threshold. Okay, so here we're interested in the average stream effect for the population, and so we need this overlap assumption to ensure that um, we can learn from what would happen to the uh, potential outcome under control condition for the treated. Uh, using the data from the control group. Okay, so the control group, even though in reality they, re they receive the control condition, they have some chance of being assigned to the treatment group. And we can leverage that non-zero probability in order to make inferences about our treatment effect. So this overlap assumption is often um, ignored, but it's, it's very important to keep it in mind. In the program evaluation, you always have to ask are there anyone who is just simply not eligible for this, this program? And if there are people like that, you need to um, exclude it from your analysis. The second assumption, which is a little bit more familiar to you perhaps, is what we're going to call unconfoundedness assumption. So this assumption has many other names depending on uh, the discipline you're in. Uh, sometimes it's called exogeneity, sometimes it's called ignorability. Um, sometimes called no omitted variable bias, or uh, sometimes called selection is based on observables. Uh, the mathematically, what it says is that conditional on the set of pre-treatment covariates x, the treatment is independent of potential outcomes. Okay? So in other words, x explains uh, the systematic variation in the treatment assignment, and what's left um, in, in terms of who receives the treatment, once you condition, on X is, is random. So once, you know, if you have two people who have same set of same values for the, co the for this covariate X, then which one receives the treatment is essentially assumed to be random. Okay. So conditional on X, basically you have a randomized experiment. So this is the assumption we often make. We try to control for the set of pre-treatment covariates and hoping that once we control for those Covariates, we have randomized, essentially randomized experiment. So under these assumptions, we can identify the average stream effect, uh, population average stream effect, which is defined as expectation of the difference of the two potential outcomes. Now, using simply the low reach rate expectation, we're going to condition on X. And now, once we condition on the X, we can invoke these two assumptions, overlap and unconfoundedness, to bring in the treatment assignment variable and set it to a particular value. Okay? Because treatment is assumed to be independent of potential outcomes, what value you set to doesn't really matter. And there is a positive probability of treatment taking either 0 or 1 conditional on any x. So it's okay to bring in a conditioning set 
either t equal 1 and t equal 0. Okay? Once we do that, you can see that the y of 1, once you condition on t equal 1, y of 1 is equal to the observed y. Similarly, once we condition on t equal 0 in the second term, and x, then y of 0 is equal to y. Okay? So now the potential outcomes, uh, once you condition on this t and x, becomes uh, the same as the observed variable, and hence we can just take the uh, regression uh, function. So this is the uh, conditional expectation function of outcome given g and x, which, which I'm going to call mu t x, and that's basically regression function. Right? So what this says is that under these two assumptions, the average uh, average human effect is identified as the difference of the regression function and averaging over that, uh, over distribution of x. Okay, so the last expectation in the last line is expectation over the distribution of x. Okay, so given this identification results, how are we going to use regression models uh, to estimate the causal effects? There are two general regression-based estimators that we can discuss. The first is the plug-in estimator. So this is a sample analog of the um, identification result I showed you. So all I did is to replace the expectation with sample average. Okay. So what this says is that use the regression and then um, estimate the expected value of the outcome under the treatment condition, that's a mu, mu hat 1, and then subtract uh, the expected estimated expected outcome under the control condition. Uh, mu hat zero. Okay. And then you do that for every observation using the value of x, the observed value of x for each, for each observation, and then compute the difference for all n observations, and then take the average. And that's basically the regression based estimator uh, for the average genome effect. Okay. So this could be a linear regression. Uh, sorry. This could be a linear regression or any other kind of regression. The second approach is the imputation estimator. So the imputation estimator is going to use a regression, but uh, instead of imputing both y of 1 and y of 0, like we did in the plug-in estimator, we're going to only impute the missing outcome. Okay? So for the treatment, treatment group, we observe y of 1. So the missing outcome, potential outcome, is y of 0. So we're going to use mu hat 0 to impute that potential outcome. That's the first term in the summation. Conversely, for the control group, we observe the outcome under control condition, but we don't observe outcome under the treatment condition, y of 1. So we're going to use the regression uh, to impute that estimate, uh, outcome. So mu hat 1 is used to impute the y of 1. And then we take a difference, and then like a, before, we take the average we do that for every single observation and take the average uh, of that difference. Okay, so that's basically imputation estimator. So these are two uh, basic estimators you could use um, for any type of regression model um, to do um, causal effect estimation. Uh, in the case of linear regression, the first one uh, represents, each of these uh, represents a coefficient. Uh, so you don't have to actually compute this, uh, this, you don't have to do this computation for each observation. You can just uh, look at the coefficients. The first one uh, corresponds to just a linear regression without uh, any, uh, without interaction between the treatment and the covariates. And so this is just a uh, coefficient for treatment variable is the first plug-in estimator. It's a, it, numerically the same. An imputation estimator turns out um, is numerically the same to the um, coefficient for the interaction between the treatment um, and the uh, um, covariates when you have the linear model with interaction between the treatment variable and, and the covariate, the imputation estimator is what you can get. Okay. So the linear regression is nice because you don't have to do this computation for every observation, 
Instead, you can uh, just read off the coefficient. Now, the nonlinear regression, such as logistic regression, you have to do this computation for every single observation. So it's a little bit more computation intensive. For example, so for logistic regression, um, I wrote the explicit um, expression here. And so you can see the regression plug-in estimator. So this is the first, thing, first estimator. You can see that um, we have predictive probability uh, for the first term, like predictive probability when the t equal 1 and the predicted probability of when the t equals 0. And you take that difference, and then do that for every single observation and take the sample average. Okay, so, and um, again, you can use any kind of regression here, probit or any uh, multinomial logic, or you know, any type of uh, regression or ma fancy machine learning models um, to do this uh, regression-based causal estimation. Now, what about the variance? So there are several ways to calculate the variance. Uh, the first way is to use analytic um, expressions. So delta method uh, using it for the conditional variance. So we can think about what is the variance of regression estimator uh, conditional on x, and just taking the ex expression on the previous slide and then chugging through the variance, um, we get this a uh, somewhat complicated expression. Okay. What we see here is that there is a lot of dependency. So for example, for given any observation i, mu1 hat and mu0 hat are correlated because they, they all come from the same data, regression estimates. And so those that's the second line covariance term. So the mu1 hat and mu0 hat are not independent. And to make things more complicated, even if uh, you're looking at the different observations, so xi and xi prime, these differences, mu1 hat minus mu0 hat, they are correlated. Right? Again, this is because the estimate, regression estimates parameters themselves come from the same, uh, same uh, data. So they're, they're all, um, unfortunately, they're all correlated. And so you have to compute every single one of these, so that could be uh, quite tedious. Uh, depending on the model. Certain models uh, are going to be very tedious calculation. So there's sort of two shortcuts people use. Uh, first one is a bootstrap. Um, if you do bootstrap, you get the unconditional variance. So instead of conditioning on x, you get the un unconditional uh, variance. And uh, as you know, what you're going to do is you're going to independently sample n observations with replacement. And then you fit a regression model and compute this uh, regression-based causal estimator, okay? and then you repeat this. So as you can see that this process is going to be quite computationally intensive because for every observation, uh, every iteration, you have to fit the model, fit the regression model, uh, depending on the model, this may take a long time, and then compute, you have to go through that computation to compute the corner of interest, and you have to repeat that. Um, so this is computationally int um, quite intensive. A shortcut uh, some people use is something I call co cozy Bayesian Monte Carlo. Okay, and, and it was um, uh, it, it, the procedure that's underlying the software, our package called Zerg. And uh, Gary King's paper describes the, the procedure. Uh, here, what you're going to do is you're going to use the theorem that's called the um, von Mises theorem, Bernstein von Mises theorem, that says the um, the posterior distribution and maximum likelihood asymptotic distribution both go to the normal and then they actually they converge each other and, uh, when, as the sample size increases. Okay, so if this is true, uh, even though you may have uh, in, computed all of this, as a frequentist, say, maximum likelihood procedure, we can use those estimates. So say alpha, beta, alpha hat, beta hat, gamma hat, so these, say these are coefficients, as if the mean of the posterior distribution, because the posterior, um, this theorem says the posterior uh, distribution converges to the sampling distribution of MLE as the sample size increases. And, and then you have, you have asymptotic um, 
variance of these uh, parameters. So basically what we can do is we can assume asymptotic normality and sample these uh, coefficients from the normal distribution. And once you have uh, these coefficients sampled, then we can calculate the quantity of interest using the formula, the regression-based formula. So this is sort of, you're estimating the model um, as if you're frequentist, but then um, when you compute the uh, quantity of interest, you're becoming the Bayesian and sampling these parameters from the asymptotic uh, approximate, asymptotically approximated normal distribution. Obviously, you can be, um, you know, fully Bayesian. So if you have a fully Bayesian model, then none of these appro approximation is um, necessary, and you can simply estimate the causal effect from the posterior distribution.